Good morning, Circleville Church, and welcome as we have a virtual worship service this morning because of the ice and the snow. I uh, welcome you in the precious name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and our Savior, as we celebrate on this what is called Epiphany Sunday. Now, the word epiphany, as you may know, is kind of like when the lights go on. And this is a time in which the church realized uh, that the gospel message was not just for the Jewish people, but was also for the Gentiles as well. Often we celebrate the, the coming of the wise men on Epiphany Sunday. So let's start with a word of prayer. Father in heaven, thank you so much that you are the good and gracious Father, and that you sent your Son, Jesus Christ, that we might know the Emmanuel, the God with us, you sent your Son, Jesus Christ, from the cradle to the cross, that our sins might be paid for, atoned for. And for that reason, Lord, we come before you to worship, to give you glory and honor and adoration in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Our opening song this morning is going to be we have come into his house, hymn number 224, hymn number 224. We have come into his house and gathered in his name to worship him. We have come into his house and gathered in his name to worship him. We have come into his house and gathered in his name to worship Christ the Lord. Worship him, Christ the Lord. Let's forget about ourselves and magnify his name and worship him. Let's forget about ourselves and magnify his name and worship him. Let's forget about ourselves and magnify his name and worship Christ the Lord. Worship him, Christ the Lord. Psalm 122, verse 1. Let us go to the house of the Lord. My friends, even though there may be a pandemic, even though there may be ice on the roads, somehow, someway, we as God's people are called to gather and worship. And so I'd like to sing that second verse again. Let's forget about ourselves. There's a lot of things that are going on in the world, whether it's personal finances, relationships between family and friends, so many things can draw our attention away from the wonder and grace of Jesus Christ. Our prayer this morning ought to be, let's forget about ourselves and magnify the name of Jesus Christ. Let's forget about ourselves and magnify his name and worship him. Let's forget about ourselves and magnify his name and worship him. Let's forget about ourselves and magnify his name and worship Christ the Lord. Worship him, Christ the Lord. We have a number of announcements. This week starts Upward Basketball, and again, we ask that you be a people of prayer and lift up the Upward Basketball program as over 140 children, boys and girls, coaches, referees, have all committed to come together next week. Over the course of the week, each team will have their practice, and on Saturday will be our first game day. But what's most exciting about this program 
is it ministers to the whole child. Their physical needs, absolutely. Learn, teaching them the, the skills of the game and, and how to be fit. But also, emotionally and psychologically and socially, and most importantly, spiritually, that these young people would come to know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, and that that truth would touch their families, their parents, their grandparents. So pray as the upward basketball season starts this coming week, that the spirit of the living God would go ahead of it and already be preparing hearts and minds for the good news of Jesus Christ. This coming Friday, we're planning to have our Trail Life Boys program and our Heritage Girls program as well. Keep those programs in prayer. What a fantastic beginning to our year we've had. As in September, we've had over 21 boys and, and now over 10 girls get involved in the program. Some special events that have taken place. We had the, the great pumpkin party where we had a big jack-o'-lantern and not only a night of games and fun, but we realized that just like that jack-o'-lantern, God reaches into our lives and takes out the garbage. And that the light of Jesus Christ goes in. And that that face that's carved under that jack-o'-lantern doesn't need to be a scary face. It can be a face of, of joy, a smile, and the light of Christ shines out. And the children and the parents were challenged with, with that message and then only a few short weeks ago, as we had our uh, Polar Express pajama party, and that whole movie is all about believing. And at the end of the night, we focused on John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth on him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Both of those programs, the, the Great Pumpkin Party and the... Uh, Polar Express Pajama Party. We had well over 75 to 100 children and, and their families. Pray that as Circleville and the body of Christ beyond these four walls shares the good news of Christ, that we believe that Scripture teaches us faith comes by hearing the Word of God. So pray for Trail Life and pray for Heritage Girls as these programs continue through the winter and into the spring. This morning would have been our communion service, but because of the ice and snow, we're gonna postpone that to next week. So again, prepare your hearts. Scripture says that we ought to examine ourselves before we partake in communion, that last supper, that remembrance meal. So examine yourselves in prayer and seek God confess, profess, and come together next week as we celebrate our oneness with God and each other because of the gift of Jesus Christ. Our first song of praise for our praise time is hymn number 241. Hymn number 241. Arise, shine. Arise, shine, for thy light is come. Arise, shine, for thy light is come. And the glory of the Lord is risen. The glory of the Lord is come. The glory of the Lord is risen upon thee. Arise, shine. For thy light is come. Arise, shine, for thy light is come. And the glory of the Lord is risen. The glory of the Lord is come. The glory of the Lord is risen upon thee. And hymn number 243, Emmanuel. Matthew 1, 23 says these words. They will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. Emmanuel, 
Emmanuel. His name is called Emmanuel. God with us, revealed in us. His name is called Emmanuel. Emmanuel, Emmanuel. His name is called Emmanuel. God with us, revealed in us. His name is called Emmanuel. And our final song before our message is hymn number 43. Hymn number 43. All hail the power of Jesus' name. All hail the power of Jesus' name. Let angels prostrate fall. Bring forth the royal diadem and crown him Lord of all. Bring forth the royal diadem and crown him Lord of all. Ye chosen seed of Israel's race, ye ransomed from the fall. Hail him who saves you by his grace and crown him Lord of all. Hail him who saves you by his grace and crown him Lord of all. Oh, that with yonder sacred throng we at his feet may fall. We'll join the everlasting song and crown him Lord of all. We'll join the everlasting song and crown him Lord of all. Father, we do come before you and we crown Jesus Christ King of kings and Lord of lords. In the next few minutes as we look at your word, as we find a challenge from the Holy Spirit to shape our lives, to mold our lives, we ask, Lord, that we would be the clay in the potter's hands, that we would be malleable, that we would be willing to be molded. And Lord, those parts of our lives that are stubborn, those parts of our lives that refuse to be molded by your hand, to be shaped by scripture, we ask that like the potter, you would carve those pieces out and toss them aside. Lord, it is our desire to be the sheep of your pasture, for we are your children. Shape us and mold us by your word, we pray. In Jesus' precious name, amen. I shared at the beginning of the service this morning that normally today would be what we celebrate as Epiphany Sunday. Many people know that January 6th is called Three Kings Day. My lovely wife was born in Puerto Rico, and for the Puerto Rican people, Three Kings Day is a huge celebration. It is a huge time of, of family and gift giving. We've, over the years, continued that tradition within our family because of where my wife was born. And my wife would always plan an educational gift of some sort. And the, the children, when they were little, would put under the bed some straw or some hay for the camels. And 
in the morning they would find some fun but educational gift to kind of remember the wise men. And those are wonderful, fun traditions that the, the Brawnius family has had. But this morning, as we read God's word, I have a challenge. Where does our faith come from? Where does our theology come from? What are the things that should truly warm our hearts and fill our minds? Now, for many of us, it's informed by God's word. But is God's word, the Holy Scripture, written and inspired and inerrant because of the Holy Spirit? Is it God's word that is foundational or is it peripheral? Here's where I'm kind of going with the message before I read Scripture. If you have noticed over the last few weeks, the wise men were way across the room on the organ, the magi. They were traveling. This morning as we read God's word, we'll see that the wise men were not there the night of Jesus' birth. That they came six weeks to a year and a half later. They had seen the star when Jesus was born. And they had to gather their resources and their caravan and, and travel from the east. More than likely, the Babylonian and Persian Empire area, modern day Iraq and Iran. And not going through the Arabian desert because nobody did that. They would have gone like Abraham up and over the Fertile Crescent into the Holy Land, into Israel. And that trip would have taken some time. Scripture does not tell us that it was three wise men. And actually the, the real word that is used in the original language is magi. Most of us shy away from that word because it's like the word magician. These were learned men who studied the stars and astrology. They studied herbs and plants and medicine. They studied math. These were the advisors to the kings and the nobles to understand the best, the most of who the Magi were. Go back and read the book of Daniel because Daniel was, was elevated in the nation of Babylon and in the nation of Persia to be the chief of the Magi, the chief of of the wise men, the chief of the learned men. And in Babylon, in Persia, the word of God would have been shared way back 600 years or so before Jesus by Daniel himself and by the children of Israel when they were taken into exile. And those schools of learning, those learned men, would have understood that someday the Messiah, anointed one, for that is what the word Messiah means. The Christ, the anointed one, for that is what the word Christ means. Messiah, Hebrew, Christ, Greek. That from the line of David, a ruler would come to save mankind. That would be in the, the libraries and, and records of of Babylon and Persia. And so these magi would have come. We don't know the number. We know that it was more than one, so it was at least two. It could have been 10, 12, 100. The caravan could have stretched for miles. Often trips like this with learned, wealthy individuals they would have an honor guard that would be with them, a small battalion of some sort, 30, 40, 50, 60, 200 fighting men. This was not just simply three men on a camel walking through the desert. And yet, often when we see the cartoons of Christmas, when we open up the children's books, 
we fall into a cultural understanding of the story. Instead of the cultural understanding, let's have the biblical understanding. For here's a challenge this morning. Revival will not come to the church unless there is first the proclamation of God's word. Revival will not come apart from the proclaiming of God's word. So let's read together our first passage of scripture, which is the story that I spoke of, found in Matthew chapter 2, starting at verse 1. Now after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea, in the days of Herod, behold, wise men, or magi, from the east came to Jerusalem after he was born, saying, Where is he who is born king of the Jews? For we saw his star when it rose and have come to worship him. When Herod the king heard this, he was troubled, and all of Jerusalem with him. And assembling all the chief priests and scribes of the people, he inquired of them where the Christ, the anointed, the Messiah, was to be born. They told him, in Bethlehem of Judea, for so it was written by the prophet, and you, O Bethlehem, in the land of Judea, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah. For from you shall come a ruler, who will shepherd my people, Israel. Then Herod summoned the wise men secretly and ascertained from them what time the star appeared. And he sent them to Bethlehem saying, go and search diligently for the child. And when you have found him, bring me word that I too may worship him. After listening to the king, they went on their way. And behold, the star that they had seen when it rose went before them until it came to rest over the place where the child was. Not the infant, not the baby, but where the child was. When they saw the star, they rejoiced exceedingly with great joy and going into the house not the stable, not the stall. And going into the house, they saw the child with Mary, his mother, and they fell down and worshiped him. Then opening their treasures, they offered him gifts, gold and frankincense and myrrh. And being warned in a dream not to return to Herod, they departed to their own country by another way. We're going to continue reading as the next piece of the story is the flight to Egypt where Joseph and Mary and, and this child Jesus left Israel to stay safe. Now when they had departed, behold, the angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream and said, Rise, take the child and his mother and flee to Egypt and remain there until I tell you, for Herod is about to search for the child to destroy him. And he rose and took the child and his mother by night and departed to Egypt and remained there until the death of Herod. This was to fulfill what the Lord had spoken by the prophet. Out of Egypt, I will call my son. Then Herod when he saw that he had been tricked by the wise men, became furious and sent and killed all the male children in Bethlehem and in all the region who were two years old and under according to the time that he had ascertained from the wise men. Then 
was fulfilled what was spoken by the prophet Jeremiah. This, by the way, is found in Jeremiah 31, verse 15. A voice was heard in Ramah, weeping and loud lamentations, Rachel weeping for her children. She refused to be comforted because they are no more. Herod killed all the baby boy children, two years old and younger, in Bethlehem and in the entire region. But when Herod died, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in Egypt, saying, Rise, take the child and his mother, and go to the land of Israel, for those who sought the child's life are dead. And he rose and took the child and his mother and went to the land of Israel. But when he had heard that Archelaus was reigning over Judah in the place of his father Herod, he was afraid to go there. And being warned in a dream, he withdrew to the district of Galilee. Bethlehem is in Judea. And the son of Herod now ruled Jerusalem and Judea, Bethlehem. So instead of returning to Judea, the land of Joseph and his forefathers, Joseph went instead to Galilee, to Nazareth, to the area of Mary's family. And he went and lived in the city called Nazareth, so that what was spoken by the prophets might be fulfilled, that he would be called a Nazarene. We have some other scripture to read this morning, but again, in a, I'd like us to draw our attention to the traditions of Christmas, the traditions that surround the, the wise men, the traditions that, that surround what we have understood as the Christmas story. You see, as a child, one of my favorite Christmas songs was We Three Kings of Orient Are. And I'd like to read for you the first verse of We Three Kings. We Three Kings of Orient Are, bearing gifts we travel afar, field and fountain, moor and mountain, following yonder star. Born a king on Bethlehem's plain, gold I bring to crown him again. King forever, ceasing never, over us all to reign. Frankincense to offer have I, incense a deity nigh. Prayer and praising, all men raising, worship him, God on high. Myrrh is mine, its bitter perfume, breathes a life of gathering gloom, sorrowing, sighing, bleeding, dying, sealed in the stone cold tomb. O star of wonder, star of night, star with royal beauty bright, westward leading, still proceeding, guide us to thy perfect light. It is such a wonderful, rich song, and yet it has so many egregious errors in it. I love the fact that this song lifts up the three gifts that were given to Jesus, gold and frankincense and myrrh. Gold, something that was fit for a king. Frankincense, something that was used in the temple for worship and prayers. Priest, myrrh, something that was used in embalming bodies, preparing them for the tomb. Jesus, here this infant child, this, this young child is, is being already prepared to be king and priest and sacrifice for you and I. It is wonderful how God's word in Matthew chapter 2 already prepares us for the truth that Jesus was born to die. And yet, 
this wonderful song of old has so many errors that are from tradition and not from scripture. We three kings, we do not know, and there probably wasn't three. They were not kings. They were not rulers. They were advisors. They were learned men. They were magi. In English, wise men is probably a very good translation of, of what a magi was. They were priestly magicians who would advise the ruling class. We three kings, there's not three, they're not kings, of Orient are. The Orient is China, is Japan, it's the Far East. Babylon was not considered the Orient. Persia was not considered the Orient. We three kings of Orient are. The title of, of the song, it's in our hymnals. It's, it's part of our tradition. Traditions are not all bad. But we as believers in Jesus Christ, we ought to know our scripture better than we know the traditions. We ought to know God's word far better than man's wrappings, trappings. And that's something that steps on the toes of a lot of people. Is it more important to keep alive the traditions or is it more important to keep alive God's word? And that is a challenge that this morning I would like you to ponder and to pray about. If something is, is important to you, why? Traditions are wonderful things. They bring families together. My family celebrating Three Kings Day. How in the world is that possible when I am so opposed to the idea of three and kings? It was a wonderful tradition to enjoy with my children. And yet, early in my marriage, my wife and I would have the little battle where the wise men would have been moved on the other side of the room. And every time my wife would move them back, I would move them away. And it was kind of a, a family joke for a while. And now everyone's past it, I guess, because dad is stubborn. But it was to make a point. We can enjoy some of the traditions of our culture, but that must never be the foundation on which we stand. God's word and God's word alone. The next passage of scripture that I'd like to read this morning is just one verse from the book of Romans. Romans chapter 10, verse 17. So faith comes from hearing and hearing through the word of Christ, the word of God. So faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of Christ, the word of God. It is more important than ever that God's word is taught and proclaimed to God's people. Years ago, this particular Sunday, Epiphany Sunday, I preached a message called Bugs Bunny Theology. And it's pretty much the same idea. It is, where are we getting our theology from? I'll share the example from that message a number of years ago. So many people think that when they die, they become an angel. When I was little, I would watch the, the Bugs Bunny cartoons and the Roadrunner and, and all those old cartoons. The new cartoons, I'm not 
very up on, so I can't say what they teach or they preach. But in Bugs Bunny or the Roadrunner, when something would happen and somebody would die, all of a sudden you'd see kind of like their spirit come from their body. and They would have wings and a halo and they would become an angel. We are not angels. God made humans in his image and he made angelic beings something completely different. And when a human being dies, they do not become an angel. They will someday be resurrected to new life, you and I, with a, with a new and glorified body, just like Jesus Christ. Scripture teaches that he has the first fruits of the resurrection. But nowhere in Scripture ever does it imply that you become an angel. I've often heard it said that when a child dies, somebody will say a beautiful, nice little comforting phrase to the mother, to the father, to the grandmother. God wanted another angel in heaven. That is not scripture. That is Bugs Bunny theology. We will often look at the, the paintings that are in so many of the cathedrals and we'll see angels depicted as these little fat cherub babies with wings. When you read scripture, angels are not depicted that way at all. They are the warriors of God. They are the messengers of God. They are the servants of God. They often are depicted with armor and swords and shields and, and, and breastplates. They are ready to do the battle of God against the demonic forces, against those who oppose God. Scripture teaches one thing, and our world takes the kernels of Scripture and perverts them. Just as the story of the wise men. Every person that I know, for the most part, was taught that the wise men need to be at the manger scene. That is clearly not scripture. Is it a salvation issue? Is it something important to fight about? Not at all. But it's an indicator of how the church gets swayed, gets tempted, gets enticed by the culture around it to be something other than what God's word teaches. So we've read Matthew chapter 2, the story. And that story has probably 20, 30 sermons in it. Things like, Herod was distressed and all of Jerusalem with him. That when a leader is encouraged or distressed, that trickles down to his people that he leads. And here was Herod the king. And all of Jerusalem knew that if he was on edge, they needed to be on edge. And sure enough, his stress, his inability to be the man that God wanted him to be brought him to a place of murdering two-year-old children and younger. That stress and that weeping and that wailing was not just for Herod, but was for the community. There are so many pieces to that wonderful story and someday perhaps we'll do a series on, on just Matthew chapter 2 and all the wonderful pieces of in depth who were the Magi and who was Herod and why was it important for, for Jesus to, to go to Egypt. I've alluded already a little bit to the gifts, the gold, the frankincense, and the myrrh and how each of those gifts pointed to the offices of Jesus as king and priest and sacrificial lamb. 
But my final passage of scripture that I'd like to read for you comes from the book of Timothy. To Timothy, verses 1 through 5. To Timothy 4, verses 1 through 5. This is Paul writing to a young man, Timothy, who he is mentoring to be a leader in the church. I charge you in the presence of God and of Jesus Christ, who is judge, the living and the dead, and by his appearing and his kingdom, preach the word, be ready in season and out of season, reprove, rebuke, exhort with complete patience and teaching. For the time is coming when people will not endure sound teaching, but having itching ears, they will accumulate for themselves teachers to suit their own passions and will turn away from listening to the truth and wander into off into myths. As for you, always be sober-minded, endure suffering, do the work of an evangelist, fulfill your ministry. I need to share with you a prophetic truth. Now often I do not take the mantle of a prophet in the idea of prophetic truth, foretelling. We already are living now in the time that Paul cautioned. For the time is coming, it's not coming, it's here. For the time is coming when people will not endure sound teaching, but having itching ears, they will accumulate for themselves teachers to suit their own passions. We live in that age right now. And Paul was not simply referring to the culture around him. Paul was referring to the church of Jesus Christ. When we read the book of Revelation, we see that much of the church in the end times will become apostate. Much of the church in the end times will look like the church, sound like the church, feel like the church, but Jesus Christ will not be Lord and God's word will not be the foundation on which it stands and the church will have turned to its own way because of its itching ears, what it wants, its own passions, its own hungers will lead the church instead of the hunger for God's word and the glory of our Father in heaven. Those days are here now. And there are churches that are grounding themselves in God's word, and there are churches that are being moved by the winds of the culture to be more palatable to those around the church. My friends, Paul says to Timothy, I charge you in the presence of God and Christ Jesus, who is to judge the living and the dead, and by his appearing and his kingdom, preach the word. That is not just the job, by the way, of a preacher. It is the job of every believer do you spend time in God's word? Do you prayerfully wrestle with God's word, seeking the, the indwelling of the Holy Spirit to reveal to you what God is giving to us in his holy, written, inspired, and errant word? Preach the word. Be ready in season and out of season. Reprove rebuke and exhort with complete patience and teaching. 
reprove, rebuke. Those are not nice words. Nobody likes to be reproved. Nobody likes to be rebuked. But we are called to reprove and rebuke one another and the world around us. We are called not to simply be nice, but to be faithful, reprove, rebuke, exhort, lift up, and with complete patience and teaching. We are in this for the long haul. It's not our place to give up on a child of the church who's walked away from Christ. It's not our place to give up on the community that we find ourselves in or the culture that we find ourselves in. It's not our place to give up on them. It is our place to be faithful instruments of the hand of God and our guide is God's word given to us in the Holy Scripture. And Paul tells Timothy, Timothy, it's going to be a rough battle because the time is coming, and for you and for me, the time is here that so many have given up sound doctrine because they don't like the way God's word sounds. They like to wrap it up in silver paper, gold paper, Christmas wrappings and trappings. They like to change the church to be more accessible. They like to change the church to make it more palatable, taste better to the children of today, to the culture of today. There's nothing wrong with speaking the language of the day, but do not change the word of God. There's nothing wrong with speaking in ways and presenting in ways that others might understand more clearly as long as what you are proclaiming is from God's word. If it is the latest and greatest thing of the world around us, then we've walked away from God's word. Faith comes by hearing, and hearing through the word of Christ Jesus, through the word of God. Do not be deceived and to think that that is simply the job of an elder or a deacon or a Sunday school teacher, or a trail life leader, or a preacher. For you are the image bearer of Christ. Scripture calls you that. The Holy Spirit dwells within you. For do you not know that your bodies are the temple of the Holy Spirit? Scripture tells you that. Do not buy into the culture where we pay somebody else to do something for us. Do not pay a preacher or an elder or, or a missionary to take your responsibility. Where you find yourself, at school, at work, in a place of recreation, do you stand and are you ready in season and out of season, in all circumstances, so to speak, to proclaim God's word? And the only way you can do that is to be in the word yourself. You see, what I so loved about 2 Timothy 4 that whole idea of our ears itching, what we like to hear, the story of the three kings, the little drummer boy. Those are beautiful little stories that we like to hear. Do not let those types of things draw your attention away from 
the wonder and grace of what God shares about Jesus Christ. <coughs> Normally when I sneeze, I tease people and say, it's not a symptom of COVID, and it's not. I have hay fever and I apologize. We're coming to the close of our message. This morning's message is the reason for the season is Jesus. Wise men still seek him. Do you? A few years ago, the, the ladies gave me a tie. and I might not like the fact that it has three wise men on it, but it has the title of this morning's message on it. Wise men still seek him. If you seek the Lord Jesus Christ, if you seek the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, if you seek to be a child of the Most High God, our Sovereign Father will put the guide in front of you, the star, to lead you where you ought to be. Will you be faithful? Will you open your eyes to see the stars that God places in your life do not let it be itching ears that pull your thoughts and attitudes and actions, but instead, may it be a humble heart, one that in prayer seeks after God, and where we start is in his word. Let's pray. Father, we thank you we thank you that the magi of old, the wise men of old, sought to worship you. And today, Lord, it is the wise men and women who still seek you to worship you, to honor and exalt, adore who you are and what you've done today Lord we pray for this church we pray for this message we pray for the truth of the gospel to be so implanted in our lives that we are proclaimers of that gospel message in all areas of our lives we pray this prayer in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Our song of response is hymn number 408. Hymn number 408. How firm a foundation. How firm a foundation, ye saints of the Lord, is laid for your faith in his excellent word what more can he say than to you he has said to you who for refuge to jesus have fled fear not i am with thee oh be not dismayed for I am thy God and will still give thee aid. I'll strengthen thee, help thee, and cause thee to stand upheld by my righteous, omnipotent hand. When through fiery trials thy path way shall lie my grace all sufficient shall be thy supply the flame shall not hurt thee i only design thy dross to consume and thy gold to refine 
The soul that on Jesus hath leaned for repose, I will not, I will not desert to his foes. That soul through all hell should endeavor to shake, I'll never, no, never, no, never forsake. How firm a foundation, ye saints of the Lord, is laid for your faith in his excellent word. What more can he say than to you he hath said? To you who for refuge to Jesus have fled. What a wonderful foundational hymn. We're going to continue in our service as we have a time of congregational prayer. And each week when you are here at worship, I strongly encourage and remind you to, to take the bulletin home. It has a list of individuals that we lift up that week for prayer. And we're going to do that right now. Father in heaven, we praise you and thank you today for the opportunity to, to worship you. Lord, this morning is different. The sanctuary feels so empty as brothers and sisters in Christ are not here, lifting up their voices in praise. I trust that they are safe from the icy roads. And next week, Lord, as you draw us together, may we lift up our voices in praise and adoration, for you are worthy of far more than we could ever think or do or imagine. <clears throat> Lord, I pray for our dear sister June Vandershaft, for our sister Cheryl Wright and Darlene Yarwood, Pour out your spirit, Lord, this morning on each of these dear sisters in Christ. Let them know that you love them. Let them know that the body of Christ here at Circleville holds them close to our hearts. Lord, we think of some ongoing prayer needs. We think of our dear sister May Lennon and Eleanor Ogden, who each stand in special need of you as as they are homebound, one in, in her home and the other in a senior living facility. Lord, this morning in a supernatural way, pour out your spirit that May and Eleanor would be united with their brothers and sisters in Christ. Lord, we think of Lorraine Otterman, sister of, of Pat Cook, Lord, she has struggled a number of times with cancer. We just ask that you would continue to be the great physician, that you would stand beside her, before her and behind her, and give her strength as she battles the results of this sinful fallen world. Lord, we, we think of our brother Scott Hill and we think of Matt Kilduff. Lord Scott as a husband and a grandfather. And Matt as a husband and a dad. Lord, each of these individuals are struggling with, with a chronic illness. Give them strength. Give them strength that they might enjoy their families to their fullest. That they might share Jesus Christ as as men of their households. Encourage their hearts, Lord. We pray this as a family. Lord, I think of our dear sister Norma Falker, Donna Kelly. Lord, we love them. And what prayer warriors they are. As they talk to one another on the phone and as they find out the needs of this family and the body of Christ beyond, and as they spend time in devotion and prayer, 
Lord, I thank you for their strength, their spiritual strength. And Lord, we look forward to the day when Norma and Donna could be here again and worship with us in the house of the Lord. Lord, we think of Bob Norris and Lee Hobart. We just praise you, Lord, so much that Bob has healed so much from his cancer, that he has again begun to gain some weight and has color in his cheeks. Lord, he went through a difficult time with the feeding tube and the cancer in his throat. But you are a God who does not leave nor forsake. Lord, for our brother Lee and our dear sister Pat Hobart, Lord, we thank you that during this season, this pandemic of <coughs> over two years now, that our brother and sister have kept their eyes on you and you've kept your hand upon them. That there have been health concerns and struggles, but you've brought them through each one. Lord, wrap your arms around each of them at this moment. I thank you for, for Lee's regular presence on, on the internet with us. The encouragement that that is, that even though we might not be able to be physically together, that as brothers in Christ, we celebrate your word and your presence in our lives. Lord, we, we think of Teresa and Jean Velastro who are continuing to struggle with the after effects of, of COVID, Teresa specifically. Lord, touch Teresa's lungs with your divine healing power that she might be able to again take a full breath to find some strength. Lord, for Gene and, and his physical recovering from surgeries in his hips and knees, Lord, let this brother and sister know they are loved in the name of Jesus Christ. And Lord, I think of our brother Carl, who two weeks ago was, was back and worshiping with us, who with a fall and with, with an illness for so long was not able to be here. Lord, thank you for our brother Carl. Let him know that his presence here as when we worship together is a light in the darkness. We continue this time of prayer, Lord, as we lift up our first responders, our, our ambulance and our fire and our police. Your word says that no greater love hath any man than this than they lay down his life for another, for a friend. Lord, protect our police and our fire and our ambulance individuals. Lord, help as a community us to respect their sacrifice. Lord, I also think of our armed services. There are so many men and women who are ready and already on the front lines, but many are ready to be on the front lines to protect our freedoms as American citizens. Lord, families have given up so much of their relationship with their loved ones because of them being in military service. I think of Jamie, who's one of our elders. I, I think of Ted, who's one of our wonderful members here who, who helps lead Trail Life. I think of my son, James. Lord, there are so many who stand in special need of you. Lord, the military life is difficult. At this moment, wrap your loving arms around our men and women in the military and strengthen them, encourage them. Help them to turn to you and not other things for strength, for peace of mind. May it not be a drug, may it not be a bottle, may it not be a, a sinful activity, but instead a walk with the King of Kings. 
Lord, these men and women in the military stand in special need, and we ought to be in special appreciation and special prayer over them daily. And Lord, I think of Fred and Dana Andre, our missionaries of this month, who work for Crew, used to be called Campus Crusade for Christ, as they share the love of Jesus with students on campuses, especially students from, from other parts of the world. And as these students come to know Christ and someday will bring back a walk with Jesus into their areas of influence, politics and business and culture. Give Fred and Dana, dear Lord, patience to reprove, to rebuke, to exhort as they preach the good news of Jesus Christ. All these things we pray for the glory of our Savior who was born to die, Jesus Christ. Amen. Our closing song this morning is song number 370, Rejoice, the Lord is King. Rejoice, the Lord is King, your Lord and King adore. Rejoice, give thanks and sing, and triumph evermore. Lift up your heart, lift up your voice, rejoice again, I say, rejoice. Jesus the Savior reigns, the God of truth and love. When he hath purged our stains, he took his seat above. Lift up your heart, lift up your voice, rejoice again, I say, rejoice. His kingdom cannot fail, he rules o'er all the earth. The keys of death and hell are ours to Jesus given. Lift up your heart, lift up your voice, rejoice again, I say rejoice. Rejoice in glorious hope, our Lord the Judge shall come and take his servants up to their eternal home. Lift up your heart, lift up your voice, rejoice again, I say rejoice. Philippians 4.4, 4. rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again, rejoice. I look forward to next week as we gather together here to rejoice and celebrate together. Prepare for communion as we remind ourselves that we are one with our Father in heaven and each other because of the gift of Christ. Let's close in prayer. Go now in the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the fellowship of the Holy Spirit, and in the hands of the Father in heaven. Be wise and still seek him. Like the wise men of old, stand on being led by the Spirit of God through his word. Amen. Until next week, my friends, God bless and go in peace.